All right, hello again. This is Philip at thebestwayd.com, and today I'm going to explore some of the techniques for working with image sequences. And this particular image sequence is sort of a, uh, a time lapse that I want to turn into an animation. All right, and um, essentially I took uh, my camera, put it on the uh, on the tripod, and uh, took a picture every 10 or 20 seconds, not religiously exactly at the same time frame every time. Um, and uh, But still, I, I stood there for a good 10 minutes and took a couple of pictures. And in the end, I had this uh, sequence of images. Um, here is actually uh, an original. Let's uh, take just a few of this image sequence and I'll go again through that a few times. Uh, these are very high resolution. So probably higher resolution than what we really need to work with. <laughs> but <laughs> what you can see is that it's uh, quite a turbulent uh, event. There is some some movement in the clouds. But it's also movement in the camera because the tripod was uh, pretty shaky. And uh, I, I will need to stabilize this animation. Right? So this is actually why I intentionally kept something in the foreground here. And it actually also was in autofocus, so that's not perfect. <laughs> it was focusing on the roof rather than on the clouds. So shame on me for not using the manual focus on that. But it's okay, it's much bigger and higher resolution than I need. And on top of that, I'll probably put it in the background in a scene where the background will be slightly out of focus anyway. So it's okay. Uh, what I'll do is I'll use the foreground here to put the motion tracker on it. And then that way I can um, I can stabilize it around one of these items here, uh, not the not the leaves because they tend to move with the wind, <coughs> but the the roof or little details like this on the roof should be a good uh, reference to to track and stabilize to. All right, so <coughs> uh, the the thing I could do is is really stabilize it right from that sequence. So let's let's do that. Uh, just to get an idea, this is fairly high resolution image, so this is probably not the place where I want to be uh, in my actual uh, production work. Uh, I, I could, but uh, you're going to run out of memory perhaps after about 20 or so frames loaded. So <laughs> you want to be careful, and in fact, uh, one thing you want to do is use the Control Shift Escape uh, key to get the task manager and see um, what are the the programs running and especially how much memory do they use like here's dogwaffle.exe uh, taking about 500 megabytes and uh, given that it's a 32-bit program you don't want to go over 2 gigs with that so keep that in mind check on that every once in a while <laughs> alright so let's go and uh, actually see the dimensions of the image under the image menu image info tells us yeah it's 5000 pixels wide 3400 uh, so fairly high resolution, um, <coughs> both di dimensions. And what I'll do is um, load from the animation menu. Um, let's go load the sequence or a portion of it, right? So the way this usually works is that you you start from the top here and you look for um, where is your file system or where are your files. Like in this case, I have this PC. Um, I have it on the D drive. And I go down to Daily Dose. There it is. And <laughs> a couple of clicks further down, I have my turbulence. And there it is, sequence one. And so what you what you'll want to do initially is just test it uh, with a few of these. Right? Doesn't have to be the first one necessarily. And uh, also be aware if you have other files, because there is a temp folder here, <coughs> a temp file. Uh, target.tga that is created by dogwaffle if you load any of these images and they're not already in Targa format it will convert it uh, internally to a Targa and <coughs> keep that temp file there so <coughs> you'll want to keep that in mind don't just go blindly uh, selecting all of these files there is one you do not want and that's this one here so <coughs> what you want to do is grab maybe the last couple here let's do the last one and a few up Okay, and load that selection. If you have multiple file formats in here, you can also filter and say, I only want to see the JPEGs. All right, there you go. That solves the issue with the Targa. It's no longer seen here. And <coughs> let's go grab that. And you do have, uh, actually the loader here can be internal or it can have an external loader. 
Um, that's uh, part of the image magic um, uh, utility that's included. But um, the convert.exe takes extra time. It's really only a solution I would recommend if you have a format that we cannot load directly. Right? It will take uh, a bit more overhead to, to make it work if you use the external loader. And it may, in fact, at times fail if, if your system is way too loaded, too, too taxed with too many things. Anyway, so I'm going to go with this <coughs> and load these images, this image sequence, into a very short animation that will nicely display what we want to do. All right, so here are images loading. We can tell there's a bit of movement and turbulence happening here in this animation. And as we play it back, now that it's done, we have a nice little sequence here. It's not high contrast. We could obviously do some improvements on that. But the, the key point is that we can work with that to understand how to use stabilization and there may be uh, motion interpolation as well. So one thing I'll do is I'll crop a little bit to a smaller part. In fact, you know, <clears throat> what I did, uh, as you probably noticed, I had some other image sequences uh, or alternates there. Uh, let's see if I load a sequence. <laughs> there, there was the sequence one here that was, that came f uh, from my camera. These are the original images, uh, but I actually rescaled them with the batch uh, processor. Uh, this one here is uh, probably a different format, maybe PNG. You know what? Oh no, it's J dot JPEG. So that's the problem. It it renamed them with a different file extension. Uh, this one here is better. The file size might be you know bigger. And if you ever need to go into these, you can certainly right click and find an option. Like if you have Airfun View installed, you might say open it with Airfun View. Now, <clears throat> it may give you a little warning, but it's still going to continue and actually show you. Uh, here's the files. Um, here are <clears throat> the images in there. All right, so these are PNG files, a little bit larger. Um, and it takes a little time to build the, the, uh, the <coughs> what's it called, the thumbnails the first time. But it's certainly usable, and you can double-click that to see it in the F1 view. You can tell it's a smaller image now, All right? So that's um, that one. If I look at the original, well, <laughs> there's quite a bit more <laughs> detail in that one. Okay. All right. So how did I convert that in the first place? Right. First thing you might want to do is use F1 view and do the batch conversion. That would be probably the faster way to do it. But if you don't have F1 view or some other image tool, uh, imaging tool, image viewers, or image manipulation tools, um, there is still a last resort in Dog Waffle, and maybe it's the first resort. So <laughs> let's go into the file menu here, and in the file menu you have a couple of options. There's a batch browser that will allow you to rename them and also uh, do something else, but uh, it may not be, oh, uh, convert the file format, but it may not do the rescaling or resampling at the same time. So if you need to actually process them in a way that allows you to to convert <coughs> more than just the name, because uh, you see the rename option and you have the convert option, but uh, we really want to do more than that. We want to also change the scale, make them smaller, or crop, or do some other things. Um, what you want to do is uh, go to the um, to the batch process. <coughs> There's also a general file converter. Um, but that one I don't think has a batch aspect, <coughs> or not that I remember. So here's the the uh, batch process, and in there you'll see uh, a very similar daily dose, <coughs> which that's in the Dropbox. I need to be on the right one here. There. This PC on my D drive, daily dose, there we go. And then go down to where the turbulent turbulence folders are. Okay, so here's the sequence of original images. And what I want to produce is something similar to this, which is basically converted to PNG, perhaps cropped, perhaps a resampled, or for sure resampled. All right, so I'm going to go do that just to show you how it's done. But it takes a little while. It's uh, These are large images, and uh, it's uh, not the fastest computer here. So uh, I'm only going to do that for a few of the images, just to show you how to do that. So let's say you have uh, this image sequence, and you have a few images, let's grab a few here, that you want to, let's take five, that you want to convert to a different format, that will be down here, save the format, but also up here, apply these functions. So this is really the main uh, feature or the main purpose of this batch process utility, 
it's to apply a number of filters and we actually only need one here in this case which is the scale or the uh, sample you can resample it or you can rescale it and uh, kind of very similar but a slightly different uh, effect in terms of the quality we may not know this i'm going to go with the scale in this case uh, you also will want to check if there's a resize, sometimes under R, uh, there might be some other options, but I don't see one here. So there's rotate, raise, rotate, and then sample and scale. Let's go with this one here. So select this and it's going to ask you what's the scale you want um, <clears throat> in the horizontal size, right? And of course that means the next question will be what's the scale you want in the uh, vertical size. And so. Here you'll want to really kind of understand, well, what was the scale you had initially? What was it, about 5,000 pixels and then some? So, you know, maybe we want about half the size, so let's make that 2,400. It's not exactly half, but it's kind of close. Well, maybe you want really much less than that. Let's make it 1,600, roughly the screen resolution I have on this laptop. Um, and, and then, so, if I want to keep the aspect ratio, I would, of course, have to know what is the aspect ratio and then multiply the 1600 by that or divide it <coughs> and uh, it's probably going to come to about 900 something like that actually uh, maybe more 1024 I don't think it's an aspect ratio in this image that was a wide aspect like a widescreen I think it was more for something like um, what's the standard 4 to 3 aspect ratio so something like that you know it doesn't matter so much for the demo to be precise but <clears throat> if you don't care about the distortion you might have it a little bit then that's fine um, you can rescale it later on <coughs> uh, in a non-uniform way to correct it to some extent all right so here's the scale i'm going to apply here's the format i want after the scaling i want the conversion to png so make sure or bitmap or you know back to jpeg but be careful because j jpeg is going to be the ending and that may not be suitable so you may want to skip that um, there is probably better to use png and here it is so i'm going to use png for that and now the question is well what what is the folder where it's coming from that's right there um, what is the folder where it's going? You need the destination right here. Right, so the destination folder, I would go and browse for that and then create a new subfolder. It's always better to have new images in its designated folder or subfolder so that you can easily identify them, work with them, find them, and not be distracted by other images that may have the same name, <clears throat> especially if you do take something like a photo, a camera, a picture. Uh, with its incremental numbering and then you convert them and you convert them back and eventually you may have multiple files of the same base name and just a different file type and god forbid even overlap or overwrite some old ones that you don't want to overwrite or lose so it's good to have them in their own folder or their own subcategory directory so i'm going to go to to this here let's make this a little bit bigger so we have a bit more visibility on the folder names and go down to turbulence there it is and so we have these and we want a new one so luckily there is a make new folder and we'll call that sequence three All right and, um, and maybe test because it's it's really just a test for the um the the process the, the workflow it's not quite the whole thing yet we only have half a dozen of images will be processing uh, let's let's make that actually about this many there so um i think we are ready to go you could also uh set this filter here to show only the jpegs if you if you had already some pngs in there and some bmps and some uh photoshop and other images psd files so you could uh, you know easily identify just the ones you want and and then select a subset of those all right i think we're good we have the scaling um there are as i mentioned a number of other things you could do there too but you do want to experiment with these folders and uh, with these options some of them are straightforward some of them are <coughs> uh, to be experimented with but it's a good collection of additional filters that um, come with it all right so let's go and process that and you see here the first one is being processed and as i mentioned these are fairly large images and it's not the very fastest computer so it will take a little while uh, to process that uh, conversion 
your your mileage may vary as they say it may take less time on your system um, and uh, I think we're already on the second one here you'll see this line go down one by one as it's going from one file to the next one and um, so there it is I'm gonna go and uh, pause the recording and then come back once it's done we have only about half a dozen maybe four more uh, images to work through so be right back don't go away all right and we are back all right so um, the interface of this uh, batch process tool will come back to to this mode and uh, we are done so we can close and we should see the SQ3 there they are um, and that's of course if if we already if we're still in this view here uh, otherwise we'll just go back to it so so here are the images we have converted they are in PNG format and what I'll do is I'll select those and load that selection which will free up the old ones and so now we have a sequence that is smaller right you can tell the, these are no longer 5,000 pixels wide the uh, image info showing 1536 by 1024 I guess I asked for 1600 but then when I set the height uh, it imposed the same aspect ratio and did the calculation or something like that um, so the next step is to stabilize that. No, the next step is to store that. Right? You want to keep a safe copy here. Uh, I mean, you have the images, the image sequence on file. You can always go back to that. Right? You go to load select uh, load sequence, and uh, in fact, it remembers um, what was the last sequence you loaded, and it goes there, and it still has that selection. So it's easy, just one click away to reload that entire sequence. But that might still be too slow, right? If we're working really uh, under pressure and on a, in a, on a tight uh, timeline deadline, um, what you want to do is really store that uh, in memory uh, so you have it immediately available to reloading, right? Imagine you mess this up, you paint over it one frame at a time, you even delete some frames, and now you say, oh, I need to restore this thing. How do I get back to that? Just click this, right? It will restore that entire animation. All right, so um, that's, of course, uh, store. You have a store image. You have store uh, selection and store brush. And you have one more, which is under the animation menu. There's actually two more. There's store to memory or store to disk. Now, if it's... Uh, a fast hard drive, uh, I would go store to disk. That one's fast enough because it's a, a short sequence, a short clip. But if it takes too long for you, what you can do is store it to memory as long as you have memory. Uh, eventually, we'll switch over to store to, 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 to the disk uh, if it doesn't have enough memory for it. Uh, however, memory is precious, so maybe you don't want to do that too much. As you work with it, you might want to keep one stored in memory and the rest keep them as a sort of a backup on disk. All right, so what do we do next? Next, we need to stabilize this, right? Remember, if, if you look at this, this is very shaky. Uh, I mean, if you look at the clouds, you can tell so much. You cannot tell so much because it's actually moving around. It's, it's zooming really quickly. It's, it's uh, you know, the turbulence is changing. But when you zoom down here, you can see this thing is getting me headaches. <laughs> so let me turn off that strobe effect because I'm sure we're getting some seizures by now. Uh, so what we need to do is stabilize that. We need to plant a motion tracker on one of these uh, details and then say, here, track this and stabilize it. So this is how you do that. St uh, stabilizing in Project Dog Waffle is done under the animated set of filters. Just like the motion prediction module, which is down here, will go up one or two. There is a stabilize f feature. I think this one came about in version 6 or 7 and then gradually has improved. In version 10, it got much better. So if you have been trying this with version 9.6, I'm sorry, this is something that uh, did need some improvements eventually, and we did in version 10. So uh, take a look at Stabilize now. Uh, you will want to see the detail up close. Zoom into it so that you know what you're going to zoom or, or track, right? And then do a dry run. Uh, nobody does this right the first time. So select a uh, click the selection here to select a motion tracker like go to a place which has a nice high contrast and a feature that will remain visible throughout the animation if you need to see there is some amount of change in the cloud patterns in the back but not a lot it's always a light gray with a slight bluish tint here so that's good it may change in intensity but so does this part and it's not moving around unlike these leaves these are moving with the wind not just with the camera but also with the wind you can tell here 
it's over here and next frame it's over here it's gone so don't track the leaves these are not reliable as a item to track but this corner here this might be a good one so click on that and that will plant the motion tracker right there and then you have two more parameters which is the size of the motion tracker the block size inside the search area and the search area you can also reduce or increase the smaller it is the faster it will be but it may lose and if the movement is too big it may not find it right it's only going up searching for it in a certain region so take the time to to really give it allow it to to find it and make it not too small uh, make it so that it can actually have a chance of finding a pattern that's not changing much and likely going to be uh, discoverable uh, from one frame to the next. All right, and then let's see what do we want to do with that. Well, sometimes you don't want to remove the motion. You don't want to stabilize it altogether. You may want to just move the motion. Uh, in this case, though, I'm going to use uh, smooth, uh, remove motion. Um, and then um, <clears throat> what do we do with the edges? Remember, as we are... Um, motion tracking it's going to find uh, it needs to apply a correction a move or a counter correction a counter move uh, so that uh, this part remains always at the same place on screen and in doing so it will have of course some edges on the left on the side on the right above or below that are not known not discovered uh, at least not in the current frame as it moves this current frame to correct it and so uh, what do we do how do we uh, what, how do we deal with those edge conditions? And we have an, a choice to say repeat it or to reconstruct it. And that will be something based on the other frames. As it discovers more space around it and moves around it, it may be able to, to actually reconstruct it. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, it it's, if it looks bad or if it looks like incomplete on the edges, I'm going to crop that part out anyway. So it's, uh, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Right, so I'm going to go go and see what we do. And are we tracking it? Yep. On every frame we saw that the red box was on the same right place. Now if we didn't, let's just uh, for, for education see what happens if we are not able to track it. Let's say I'm, I'm tracking this corner, something similar, but I'm, I'm telling it on a very small scale, uh, something like this, and I'm also going very close. So here it's probably going to be desperately looking for it because the movement is too fast, too big, it's too far out and it will be fall it will be falling outside of my little light blue box, the search box, so it may not find it. It went really fast, but it may not find it and actually maybe it did, I don't know. Sometimes it's better than I think it is. So uh what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to make it work. I'm going to say let's go grab this thing here and uh the search box is here, out there. The the details I want to track are here. Let's go. That's a good one. So I'm going to go actually do that. There you go. And don't do a dry run. And now it's good. Now it's live. OK, so now it has detected. You saw that two passes, first to detect the movement and then to correct the images with that account of correction, account of movement. So now as you scrub through that, this thing is no longer moving, right? We have stabilized against that little detail we zoomed in. And that's exactly what we wanted. Now, over time, there were some changes in the lighting. You can see it's a little bit darker, a little bit lighter from one frame to the next that's because of the cloud patterns and if you you know if you have automatic lighting it might compensate to some extent but still not exactly the right amount uh, so that's to be had but at least we have a nice cloud turbulence now that's pretty stable imagine that you don't need a, a tripod you can you can correct this in uh, well I actually I had it on a tripod but they're very shaky uh, puny tripod and every time I went with my hand to trigger that I didn't even use a, a little remote I triggered it manually uh, it would move a little bit right so that's why I needed this motion stabilizing and then one thing you could also do first of all st uh, store that image again and then the next thing you could do is actually refine it or stabilize it even more you might actually um, want to stabilize it again to to do even more detail work here maybe here all right maybe stabilize on that corner um, so let's just see what happens. Oh, I haven't done that one yet. Let's see if we're going on the wrong direction with this. Let's go uh, filter once more and uh, animate it, stabilize. All right, 
and this time I'm gonna go uh, again dry run first select the tracker let's place it right here there's a nice little high contrast area here that's probably not gonna change a whole lot and um, what I'm gonna do is um, give it something like this I know it's not moving too much anymore so I don't need to uh, to search too far uh, if, if it's moving at all um, but uh, I might want to well, let's just do this and see what happens okay we have a good tracking there let's go and undo the, this let's set the motion tracker one more time where was it about here and go okay and so now we have a pretty darn stable situation. It's still moving off by maybe one pixel or two, but that's good enough for the precision we need. Now you see the edge condition here on the left side, right? It basically replicates the other side. It wraps it around, but that's okay. As I mentioned, we're not going to worry about those edges. Uh, we're going to crop them out later on. It's much, it's very small compared to the entire image. We're not going to notice it or we're not going to have it in the end. All right, so this is the stabilized uh, image sequence. Let's go store that one too. And the others we might actually do without. Let's go close this one, close this one. And we now have our image sequence. It's a relatively short one, but we can certainly add some um, motion um, interpolation or, we, or, or perhaps just a plain uh, uh, time stretching to that. Let's see, right click on that on the timeline and do a time stretch and say we want it twice as long 16 frames or twice again and with frame blending and see what that does all right and all right now the problem with time stretching is that it does give a little bit of blurry transition frame by frame so because you can see here we see the cloud from before and a part of the cloud from the next sequence the next frame. So as we as you scrub through that, you can see it's doing a little bit of a, <clears throat> you know, that's the blending. It's it's coming in, going out, coming in, going out. It's not perfect, but it's all we got. No, it's not. We actually have a motion prediction module we could use, and sometimes that will work too. So I'm gonna go just experiment with the motion prediction module a little bit. Let me go back to this animation. That's why we store it so we can quickly experiment and filter animation and motion prediction module there yeah. so with the motion prediction module same thing let's go to dry run mode first and we are going to extrapolate frames uh, we do want some tweens let's say three is fine initially um, we don't want cartoon mode we want the uh, the distance where it's going to look for these guys these are the little square or squarelets i call them each of those is going to receive a motion tracker all right, and so what you want to do is uh, set it to a relatively small size, maybe eight, and uh, allow pretty far to look for that, not too far. But one problem is that it's it's going to not find everything as it moves because it's not moving; it's disappearing and new stuff appearing. Right? Remember that turbulent nature. <laughs> this this pixel or this squarelet doesn't exist before and then suddenly it's there so over time things are going to be lost and that's where the motion prediction module has a bit of a difficulty uh, a challenge so uh, if you set the fudge factor too low it might do something uh, awkward like zero let's let's try that we'll see what that means when I say awkward uh, particularly along the edges here you'll see some almost like shock waves around it and actually for something that's supposed to look turbulent it's not going to look too bad at times it might be actually a nice little add-on so let's go and uh, try that uh, we don't need to scan for dropped frames uh, let's go <coughs> with that 19 frames okay so that actually looks pretty decent for the most part um, if we if there were any side effects uh, it was not too recognizable because um, it's already doing the side effect you know as the turbulence is happening but uh, let's say if we set the fudge factor to back to 400 it might be even better um, I don't know let's go see that it's a little bit faster this time let's go do a dry run uh, I mean undo the dry run let's make it oh, actually let's do one more dry run at let's say seven or eight and that's gonna give us 49 frames Okay, 
and then um, actually let's give it let's give it go back to zero one or something like that on the fudge factor let's see what we have with that yeah there's a little bit of turbulent uh, edge condition here but it's not too bad um, I'm gonna go sample stochastic two that's gonna be even slower and that's where it's really helpful if you have a multi-threaded computer <coughs> I mean <laughs> more than dual core like core 2 duo that's uh, passe my windows xp uh, laptop still runs uh, core 2 duo but you need eight cores you need 16 you know we can go how can go up to 64 cores if you are on a xeon with two chips uh, 16 cores age you got 32 you still can go higher uh, the new zen <coughs> processor announced by amd that's awesome up to 64 cores I'm not sure exactly when, but the, the architecture is there, they're starting to release. And if you have the need and the means, and this certainly has the needs, uh, go, with, uh, go with something that has a lot of cores because we are multi-threaded here and we can make this go faster. All right, I'm gonna do even one more, which is a refinement pass for my final dry run. Undo that and go. So now we have 49 frames that are gonna be calculated <coughs> based on a very turbulent <coughs> animation to begin with and um, <coughs> we'll see if we can do a fairly decent job at calculating some interpolations so imagine this you 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 start with just a few pictures right you take put your camera on a tripod you take a picture uh, or even you just rest the camera on the roof of your car and you take a picture and then 20 seconds later you take another one and 10 seconds later you take a third one and 10 seconds later another one and so on so every once in a while and then you sip at your coffee like I'm doing right now hold on there you go and then five seconds later you take another picture and so now you have uh, 20 pictures that you've taken of this turbulent scenario in the background uh, of uh, above the mountains in your backyard over the beautiful landscape you're contemplating and you have a sequence of images that you can turn into an actual animation a movie all right so this is done i'm going to go close this and uh, since we use the motion prediction module remember the, f the last frame is the same as the first frame it does this little wrap around thing so you can delete that first one and the first frame is the same as the last but now we have an animation that looks a little bit better all right well, you can see there's some, some edge condition here. It wasn't all that perfect, but it just looks even more turbulent, right? So it's actually not too bad. <clears throat> all right, so let's say we can live with this. What else do we need to do to use this in our animations <clears throat> that we will want in the background? One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say this looks good as a starting image for our elevation map. I'm going to keep that for now. And then <clears throat> I'm going to go and... Um, Oh, we have some people playing here since I'm running in inside of uh, <coughs> of of steam um, so okay so I'm gonna crop now we don't need the roof in the foreground anymore we don't need uh, these edge conditions here uh, what I'm gonna do is crop and um, with that I'm gonna go use the image crop tool it resizes to fill the entire screen and then I can go and say okay, let's go a little bit inside here uh, the bottom is still visible let's go move it up down move it it's doing left and right uh, symmetrically or at bottom and top now when you preview it like this you want to make sure this top is not going to be clipped off so make sure you scrub through that to see that it's not reaching the top altogether you have a little bit more you can go down here a little bit like this okay down here below same thing uh, and on the right and left side you could go a little bit wider but just make sure it's not going to reach any of the ugly edges all right I think we're good with that let's go crop it right click and crop <coughs> and we're done all right so this is definitely one to keep and this one I would keep on disk um, it's uh, that way if the program runs out of memory crashes power out just the stuff that happened to my laptop last week it's not going to be um, lost forever right you can easily find it back in the temp folders all right so here is our animation sequence and uh, what else we need to give it a bit more contrast so let's say if we go image expand dynamic range that's already making the blue even bluer and a little bit more contrast on here 
All right? Maybe we want this black and white. Let's go uh, Ansel Adam mode here. Uh, let's go Ansel Adam with uh, exposed through lens. And here you can go with, uh, if you go to the blue, you have a bit more contrast. And there's actually more contrast to be had later. Once it's black and white, it's going to look, is there a pixel that's white? It's going to look, is there a pixel that's black? And these are dark gray, but they're not totally black. So there's probably even more we can do on the dynamic range. Yeah, but you can see it's a little bit darker now. <laughs> All right. So now we have a dynamic range that's showing us even some slight higher elevation uh, bands of clouds there too. Now maybe we don't like that, so maybe we say um, go to adjust uh, curves or contrast value and so on. I'm going to use the curves option here and say dark should be even darker for a little while and bright should be a little bit saturated, not too much. Oh, that's awesome. You can do a side by side on that. So as you're adjusting things, um, many of the filters have this side by side mode. Right, as you're adjusting things, you can you can see the effect on one side. And this, by the way, is something you can use to create a, a selection mask to select the clouds. Right, um, so that could be an interesting uh, tool as well. To select an animated selection mask that follows the clouds. All right, so let's go something like this and <coughs> apply that. Oh, um, actually, that was a bad move. We need to apply that throughout the entire animation, not just on this one frame. Right, so let's go do that again. Filter, adjust, curves, and the curve is still there. Let's go apply it, and now click not OK, but click Animate. That way it's going to uh, apply the filter to all frames. <laughs> and we are in the game. All right, so we have a beautiful pyroclactic cloud explosion just from a few images. Right, what did we start from? About six or seven images. Um, and a little patient, a little bit hard work, and not so hard really. <laughs> um, we can easily get this going. All right, let's store this one. Again, let's store it to disk. It's still a relatively short time. Um, I'm gonna delete. I'm gonna delete this one. Okay. And so this is one that we probably want to keep. All right. So you'll want to save that as a DWA dog waffle animation DWA file. Um, you want to also save it as AVI if you want to use it somewhere else. Right, save as AVI uh, and select a codec that's lossless. Right. So you don't introduce uh, additional noise or, or lossy uh, pixels. Um, and you could also save it as a sequence, a right? PNG image sequence. If you want to take that into Moho, formerly known as Anime Studio, you have a nice little animated background and uh, you can do some more uh, motion prediction uh, interpolation here on top of that. Right? You could say, well, okay, let's how about we make this even slower. Let's right click here and uh, time stretch some more and say double that, double that even more. Oh, maybe not. Let's go gradual here. Let's go, what was the original? 47. Let's go into half, like 25% increase. So another 47, half of that, right? Another 24 or something like that. So that would be 128 roughly frames. Make sure you are doing the frame blending and go. <laughs> and um, we will get rid of the uh, stabilization information that we got from the prior. Oh, that was a question as to whether we want to interpolate that too. No, we don't. We could actually do without. Save some memory with that. Where are we on memory? Control, Shift, Escape. Um, let's see how much RAM we're currently using. Still only 420. So that's good. Uh, 428, 429 um, <laughs> megabytes. All right, so um, let's see. We have... A little bit shorter animation now, and I think this looks awesome. This is this is just perfect. So let's let's go keep this one, store this one uh, to disk, and <coughs> it never ends. You always keep going. Let's say there's something else we want to do with that. Let's say we want to show some lightning activity. All right. So some lightning activity is something that you might see on occasion. Let's say this is a night scene. First of all, we want to take this into photographic filters and day for night uh, that will turn it day for night will reduce the contrast and make it a bit more like uh, a scene at night maybe with the moon and the more you apply that the darker it gets day for night a little bit more and that's not the only way to do it I mean you can certainly also use the value filter <coughs> let's see where is it adjust value 
and reduce the contrast. Let's do the side by side here and reduce the contrast and then also make it darker and darker and so now you're getting even more into the uh, the night scene right so now you're looking at night vision uh, not night vision in the sense of the green look with the goggles but in the sense of looking at it at night and if you change your mind you can always go back to expand dynamic range and it's gonna go back to very high contrast <coughs> so let's say we want to actually do this on this one uh, add some lightning okay finish this there you go all right and so on this lightning um, let's go to this tool here this is the one two three four fifth one from the top in the toolbar uh, it's a tool that has the gradients and lens flares and some other special effects so right click on that and you can see some extra tooling including the lightning tool you can see that also if you select to click it uh, you'll see the tool here the FX tool has a context bar and there is some lightning. All right, so the lightning is something that um, you may want to choose the color for. Uh, something kind of a yellowish, but very close to white. Something like that. And <clears throat> um, then you have the scale and the softness. Let's see what happens. So grab one spot like here and go over here to the right and you'll see a first lightning. Okay, that's kind of cool, but it's not perfect. Let's say we want a lightning that goes out and comes back in. So you can't really do a curve with it, but you can do multiples. All right, something like this. Now we want to animate this. All right, so what we're going to have to do is go from one frame to the next and leave a bit of an impression. So let's say we go from this frame here and we'll see lightning strike out like this. Boom. Next frame we'll go another lightning. It's not the same but um, maybe there's two of those. All right. So now we have these following like that. And the thing is if we want to show this as an animation uh, maybe we need a little bit of a, re a remnant of this one on this frame as well. We need to show that a little bit. So we want to see lightning that travels. Right? So um, in fact let's do this. I'm gonna go quickly back to a, a slightly darker look. Let's go adjust value. Um, something like this. <coughs> Actually let's, let's restore <coughs> the original animation. Let, let me go here. <coughs> this one here is 128 frames but I need it darker so let's go filter just <coughs> value, animate, apply that all. <coughs> Excuse me here, I need to scratch my voice. All right, so <coughs> I'm going to store this. This is one I will want to work with a few times. So let's keep it on disk as well. Okay, you can tell it's taking a little bit longer now. I don't have an SSD drive. If you're on SSD, you're in heaven. This is going to be so much faster. All right, so what I'm going to do is uh, add some lightning um, somewhere about 20 or 30% into the timeline. So about this one here. So I want to see that frame. Let's scrub to find it. There it is. Okay, so I'll select one of these frames and I'll have a lightning that travels from left to right. And it comes out of this dark area first. So uh, first lightning, maybe I need to set the right amount of um, appearance here. Yeah, that's good enough. That's the way I like it. Okay, so I'm going to go um, something like coming out here and then actually double up a little bit. I have a couple of these. Uh, a little bit more softness. Okay, let's undo all these. And that's not exactly how I envisioned it. Maybe this way. And that's a little bit better. Okay, so we got this one. Next frame, we still want to see it, but we'll do that with what's called the, the ghosting. So we'll kind of go around like this. One frame at a time. Just keep an eye on where, where the lighting is actually happening. And maybe you need another one here and another one here. And then here we go. And actually we split it. You know, something like this. And then here, this guy continues. And here, it continues this way. All right, so we have a sequence now where this thing is traveling left to right. 
And all the while, the animation in the back is still happening, right? It's not static, it's moving slowly, but it's moving. So this lightning now, we want to kind of show a blending or a ghosting so that it's not just here and then gone, right? You want to see a little bit of this thing here, you still want to see a little bit. Let me zoom in here. You want to see some of that still, even on the next frame. Kind of, kind of a blended fade. So it, it gradually ghosts away. And that's what you can do with the timeline. In the timeline, you can do um, the animated sequence here has a ghosting. And you can say, I need four frames or three frames. Let's keep it at four and apply that. So it's now doing a ghosting effect. It's actually going backwards through the frames. That's, that's a funny little side note. <coughs> but um, at any rate, it's going to add a sort of a, a ghost image of the, of the animation. So as you scrub through it, you can see now it doesn't have it doesn't have just one image there, it has a few. Now it might be blended a little bit, right? It might look a little bit faded and you might need to reapply or increase the contrast a little bit. Let's go do that. Let's go add that filter again, <coughs> values, but this time let's not make it darker, let's reset that and instead increase the bright parts um, or order the gamma, right? Or the contrast or all of them at the same time. So you can you can play with this to uh, to create a, a brighter uh, appearance. Let's say higher contrast and brighter, something like this. Okay, and animate that. <coughs> so the clouds appear and then the lightning strikes from left to right. <coughs> okay, so that's that's one technique. And then the next thing I want to do is actually have the whole clouds get a little bit brighter too, right? If we have this lightning happening, uh, it's not just there. It's going to have to make the environment a little bit lighter too. Um, so one thing we can do is, first of all, store this to disk and, and then uh, combine it with itself, right? So what you do is you store it, you create it as, uh, you, st you store it, you have a stored copy, and then you designate it as your animated swap. And then you say how to combine this with the swap. So you right click here and you combine it. And then you, by default, it's a multiply mode, but you could do a couple of others. You could do an additive mode, which makes it very bright now, maybe too bright. Let's try some others. There's a uh, screen mode, um, that's too bright. So there's a couple of modes here that might be really useful. Tracing paper, uh, where the light is going to be much lighter. I think the multiply is really the way to go, but there might be more. So try the others too. Hard light, right? That might be actually interesting. So you get a bit of contrast, but whatever is bright gets super bright. So apply that. You do a merge with swap over the entire animation sequence. <coughs> and so now we have, well, it's flickering during the rendering, but once it's done, we have uh, a, a nice bright uh, lightning strike here and we still need to also lighten the scene, right? While the lightning is happening, this these clouds should be a little bit lighter. So one way to do that is to bleed this brightness into the neighborhood. That's with the uh, filter called photographic filter, light diffusion. Uh, you can do that. Right? So anything that's light will be bleeding around into the neighborhood and will provide a very localized uh, uh, brightening. Um, another, another technique perhaps is this other filter, uh, is a soft contrast improvement. Um, that one, you can add some lightness, reduce how much darkening is happening, reduce the scope of the softness, and that also tends to be a pretty good <coughs> filter <coughs> to increase <clears throat> the the lightness, but really what we should do is the entire scene altogether should get lighter. So one thing I can do is you can say, let's go to, to this frame right here and uh, simply make this entire thing lighter. Uh, or maybe not quite uh, from the beginning, maybe here, maybe this thing here. So you could even just paint it, just add a little bit of, uh, you know, what do we need? A, a little bit of an oval here and make it very soft. Let's use the oval selection tool, uh, something like this. Right there, that's our alpha selection, and then I'm going to uh, make it kind of blurry. Uh, select uh, blur Gaussian blur selection there, 
um, to to add a lot of fuzzy edging to that and and then just make it brighter I mean worst case you just erase this to white that's too bright but then you um, you have the the softness it's not exactly erasing it altogether plus you can use the interactive undo to say do not that much just a little bit of that right you don't want to totally blur it out but the idea is to give it a bit of whitening or brightening there right and then if you if you clear that selection you see now the scene is a little bit lighter here so it looks like this lightning strike is really emitting light towards the neighboring uh, clouds um, so let's go to the next frame and that's something you could do one by one or you could go um, even perhaps track this <clears throat> create this uh, oval once and then just move it over so let's do that one more time create an oval uh, roughly this big <clears throat> and make it uh, very soft uh, with the Gaussian blur something like this um, maybe not that much something like that um, and then um, and that's the selection we might want to store let's keep that one handy right <clears throat> and um, and then uh, again do the erase uh, to white that's too much let's go interactive undo something like this All right now use the control shift to move this over to the next frame make sure you go to the next frame and position this thing right over here All right control shift control and then not shift control and drag this around will will move your uh, selection mask and and then so at this time you can just uh, again right click um, to white that's too bright undo that but the nice thing is it's not going to be all the same undo level sometimes it will be it'll be a little bit brighter and it will add a nice little uh, variation to this as the glow is moving forward let's go to the next one here again control shift to move it here now here you may need to make that selection wider because we have three different pieces uh, that are um, that are contributing to the lightning here uh, three lightning directions so you can go to the selection and transform that selection right where is it transform selection and you could say let's make let's scale it up a little bit something like this and okay that and then again control to move it in place you could also rotate it I think can we I think we can rotate it also right selection um, transform selection yeah there's a rotate so if you wanted that to be more of an a vertical oval you can certainly do so and and move it down something like this okay that and then control to move it down even more maybe it's too big now I don't know but uh, you see how the the what the idea is you can you can do some local uh, brightening here based on where the the lightning is going through so let's go uh, white that and give it a little bit more lightning on these clouds and then let's see we have one or two more this one here will go back to the original which is great this is why we want that stored alpha in fact we want to store this one too let's go selection store selection and because we might want to go back to this one so let's keep that uh, this one here we need to replace this so now we have it here let's go control shift to move it over where the next level of lightning is and we go to uh, erase uh, white or actually instead of erasing to white another technique would be to actually just paint uh, use the paintbrush right click here to like a large airbrush and make it very soft reduce that opacity down to next to nothing right? so you can just paint over that where well, that's the dark let's undo that let's go with the right button there you go so you have a bit of a lightning there and that's actually another way you can also do you know if there was another lightning you needed over here um, you could also control you could go here and and just erase a little bit there and have some of that you know you can easily have the whole path uh, look like it's ionized by this lightning for a little while okay one more lightning over here control this down here and there you go with the mouse so so many different techniques to do that and now we have uh, let's clear the selection and we have now a lightning that's moving and you can see it's a bit rough but it's going to move really fast 
And the whole idea is that it's it's kind of blinding or blurring. In fact, maybe if we want this one here to be particularly impactful, what you do is you um, you you make the whole thing a little bit lighter. You go to the filter, adjust color or value actually, and uh, reset it, and then say, well, let's make the whole thing lighter. Yeah, in, brighten up the the sky, light up the sky, right? Boom! Look at that. So we now have a, a lightning boom. See this? Boom, right? So let's go play it in in, in boom. Right, that's what's happening. It's like the sky lights up. Boom. Okay, blinding. Uh and then there's also more. I mean you could you could add a little lens flare there. You could uh go to to this dude here and say lens flare, or even just a nova. But the lens flare is definitely my favorite when it comes to that. So let's go something like this little fella and add some. That could be another thing too. You could get some um, some lightning happening uh, even before there. This one, boom. Okay. So what's this look like now? Sure. Oh, awesome. All right, so so now we can even blur that some more by adding uh, a little bit of ghost, right? So this bright is really just one frame. Out of th it's 30 frames per second playback, but you want that to linger a little bit because you've been blinded and you want that, that light to kind of stay a little bit longer. Well, then go back to that um, uh, ghosting, right? And have the ghosting stay even longer. Uh, let's go ghost and don't overdo it too much, but let's say five or six frames. And then that way you'll see the lightning um, <clears throat> stay a little bit longer there. Or maybe just two or three frames. Let's do three. Apply that. All right, so now it's going to have uh, the presence of this lightning a little bit longer. All right. I think we're done here. Almost done. Boom. Okay. All right. So we have, see now here is the light. And then it's not totally dark again. It stays. It takes a few more frames before it's back to normal. All right now, you might also want to increase the contrast. Select one of these frames and say uh, expand dynamic range. There you go. That'll be good. There'll be some bright ones there, and there'll be a black sky. So this is really a good way to create this kind of. Uh, whoa! This is very dark now, right? I mean, this is really night vision storm clouds. Perhaps too much. And this is why I wish I had stored the prior one so I can easily undo that. Well, that's what you do, right? You go back here and uh, you select that one. I don't know if that's the one I want to go back to. Maybe this one didn't have the lightning. This one has it. Right. So anyway, whatever you do, save often. <laughs> uh, this one may not have it, actually. Does it? Yeah, it, I think it doesn't. Oh, it's the uh, the animated... No, it should have it. So let me st restore this. There you go. There you go. Okay, so I'm back to where I was before the lightning. Did I have the lightning here? I don't think I did. Did I have the lightning here? I don't think I did. Yep, so <laughs> see, I, I saved one too few. I should have saved more. Anyway, we got the technique. We got the idea. Uh, I'm just going to do this one here. I'm going to say, well, what? how about we don't have the glow effect follow, but we just have right when we have those three let's go find it when we have those 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 three here we we want to add some lens flare maybe one before as well this one here and this one so let's go to the lens flares and uh lens show the lens flares and let's see if there's a better flare yeah, maybe this one here we could point at this one and place it around here. You know what? That's one thing. We can do kind of a, a, a sphere or a, a fireball or something that's moving forward one frame at a time. So it's right here at the tip. Place it right there, then place it here. I'm going backwards here. Okay. there. And the frame here might actually be where it starts, like this. Boom, 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 moving over. Then we have Something like this here, and there's actually two. It's splitting. Now here it has split into three. Put three balls there. 
right? And then we have just this one survive. This one might be up here. This one might disappear over there. And then this one here is still, come on, get out of here. Uh, something like this here. That's where the fireball went. And then it gradually disappears. You can see this thing here is lingering, but it's going away. There you go. And then maybe there's a big bright explosion off the camera, and we still see something about it. Sort of a double up on the lightning. Bingo, look at that. All right, let's go play that. There you go. That's something that happens a lot in, in, sky, in the sky when there is a storm. There's not just one lightning. There's like some twin brothers lightning up, <laughs> uh, doubling up here. So, all right. So hopefully this was uh, not too much of a distraction. This is not painting. This is something that Dog Waffle does too. It's animating and uh, it's uh, allowing you to create some fancy effects. Um, and of course, we'll use these as backdrops. Uh, I'm going to go save this to AVI. Uh, I'm going to say, okay, my AVI, my documents folder, why not? Uh, save this to AVI in a format that is uncompressed. Oh, and be before I do that, I need to make sure I'm actually using dimensions that can be used in the video format of choice. So I want to make sure I have not something like odd dimensions. Let's go to image info because I cropped it manually. See? 1323 that's no good so i need to have something that's a bit more of a uh, an odd number a power a, a multiple of two a multiple of four multiple of eight even better so i'm going to go and resample that and resample it to what dimensions let's say if i keep the constraints here let's say i want to go to 720p 720 uh it's 1244 nobody's going to notice if i cheat here and turn that to 1280 right 1280 by 720 perfect all right nobody nobody better say nothing here i cheated <laughs> but i don't think you'll notice any flattening or squeezing of these clouds um and and that's the thing about it it's all right it's not science you know <laughs> you you want to have fun within some regulations and limits there all right so this one is 1280 by 720 look at that we started we started with just half a dozen a handful of frames of pictures have this beautiful animation now okay so this I am certainly going to save as an AVI but still lossless I'm gonna call this AVI 1 I'm gonna do a whole bunch of these videos and use them in the background with my mountain scenes in fact the mountain scene might be might be derived from this original image as an elevation map or it might even be an animated elevation map by using the same video itself as the elevation map for the terrain i mean it's insane what you can do here with <laughs> pd howler so i'm gonna go um save and i'm gonna save to my beloved lagarith lossless codec the best of the best of the best and um no need to configure that it's all ready and go all right so that i can uh use as a background and uh, we'll do that and then just show the final result i think we've seen enough here uh have fun i'll see you next time